This morning, the Mississippi, the Missouri, and the Merrimack rivers are raging. Homes here have washed away. Neighborhoods are torn apart. I've never seen that before, and uh, well, it's a historic flood. Parts of I-44 shut down. The Coast Guard and the National Guard have been deployed. All hands on deck, ready for rescues. In some spots outside St. Louis, flood records have been shattered. In Eureka, they've never been hit this hard. It's four feet high here, because I'm six feet tall. With hundreds of homes now islands, thousands more are in danger. Nearly two dozen levees are at risk. Power plants, water facilities are down. The rising river cresting around Valley Park, where nearly 900 have been forced to pack up and get out. It's really devastating to think about everything, our own home going under and everything that in it. With the Mississippi River in St. Louis expected to crest today, the flood stage sits at 30 feet. The water here expected to reach 13 feet above that. They're packing tens of thousands of sandbags to fortify cities, big and small. The next 24 hours critical. As the water rises, any sense of comfort vanishes. I just pray that everything goes good and that we're, you know, safe. The latest powerful El Nino storm is hitting the West. Warnings, watches, and advisories are up all along the coast of California for heavy rain, flooding, and high surf. Have a look at the Los Angeles River. The water rose yesterday from less than an inch in the morning to several feet by midday. Ben Tracy's in the thick of it. El Nino round two is packing a punch. This morning, mud cascaded down hillsides right onto the freeway. Drivers stuck in rising water were rescued from their swamped cars, and several feet of snow blanketed the mountains. These storms battering the west coast also drenched Arizona, where a man and his young grandson were pulled from their Hummer after getting swept up in raging floodwaters. Samantha Young is the child's relieved mother. Unbelievably thankful. I can thank God, you know, a thousand times. <laughs> Perfect. It wouldn't be enough. Record amounts of rain have fallen in parts of Los Angeles, and the National Weather Service says a gust NATO damaged eight buildings near downtown, ripping off part of the roof and blowing out windows. But the region is also getting something it desperately needs water. Some of the billions of gallons of stormwater inundating rivers in Los Angeles are being diverted into recharge basins where they replenish groundwater supplies. Gary Hildebrand is the deputy director of the Public Works Department. How much water are you capturing in these places? Well, in the storm that occurred yesterday, for example, we were able to capture 1.6 billion gallons of water, which is enough water for around 40,000 people. The concern now are these saturated hillsides like this one that burned in a recent wildfire. The mud is streaming off the hillside, and at the base of it, you have a bunch of homes and a bunch of very worried homeowners. Scott, if there is any good news tonight, it's that the rain that is forecast for tomorrow is expected to be much lighter. Ben Tracy reporting. Thanks. You need to be off the roads for this storm. I've never been as confident about anything as I am about this one. Seven to eight inches and counting already. Some of the computer models suggest another 20 before all is said and done. We are up over 7.3 feet here in Atlantic City. High tide happened at uh, 6.43 this morning. We are in the height of the storm right now in New York City, S plus as we call it. You can't even see the top of the buildings here in Columbus Circle. It is coming down. Okay, we're in Stone Harbor, New Jersey. Um, I'm just going to get right to the picture. We're flooded in. We cannot leave our uh, hotel. It's all of uh, the back bay flooding. This is the flooding that you're seeing. It's 240 and that really matters if you're in the five boroughs of New York City. Take a look at Times Square right now. Visibility 
down to an eighth of a mile. You look down Louisiana Avenue and it's a whiteout. You can only see about two blocks as the snow gets blown by these wind gusts of 30 miles an hour. Just to give you an idea, conditions have worsened here. We've got a travel ban still in effect. Do want to tell you that New York City is reporting at least 200 crashes, at least 300 vehicles that needed assistance. And now officially 21.4 inches at Reagan National. It is the second largest snowstorm on record here in the city. Jonas is now gone. We have records that have been set. The biggest snowstorm of all time at places like JFK, 30 and a half inches here at Central Park. Let me show you the roads too because they're clear as could be. No problems here, at least on the main arteries. And I gotta say, the perfect weather for sledding. Look at this white fluffy stuff. The Environment Agency has warned of further flooding in the north and southeast of England as Storm Jonas reaches Britain. Heavy rain and strong winds are expected today and tomorrow. Specialist teams have been deployed across areas of Cumbria and Yorkshire, which were both badly hit in December. Well, the Met Office has issued yellow Be Aware rain warnings for 10 areas across the UK. The Environment Agency has issued nine flood warnings for the southwest, northeast of England and Wales. There are 90 flood alerts already in place. In Scotland, 49 flood warnings have been issued, majority in the south and the west of the country. Sky's Fraser Maud sent us this update from Appleby in Cumbria. Well, Storm Jonas is already here in the northwest of England, although perhaps not in full effect at the moment. 30 to 50 millimetres of rain are expected across much of the, the northwest and in parts of the southwest as well, with 100 millimetres of rain over the next 24 hours or so on some of the more exposed higher ground. And that's what can cause the problems in places like Appleby here, as it hits the higher ground, comes down those steep hills, saturated, of course, still from the heavy rains that we've had over the past few weeks, and uh, into the watercourses. Now, uh, over Christmas or at the start of December and through past Christmas as well, the floods here meant that the bridge behind me, you couldn't actually see the arch in the bridge. The water was fully up, almost cresting over there. It did top over some of the other bridges uh, in Appleby and caused serious flooding. So people will be keeping uh, a real weather eye uh, on the rain at the moment. So the worst of it's expected uh, in the early afternoon. It will ease off, uh, we expect, sometime during the later afternoon and then come back again tonight. Uh, so people here maybe not too worried at the moment. A lot of the properties that were flooded three times here uh, in December uh, are empty now. They've got the dryers in. They're trying to, uh, to, to dry those properties out so it would set them back if it were to flood again. But at the moment that's not too likely. There is some risk of localised flooding. There's a lot of standing water around on the roads already. Uh, but at, uh, at the moment no severe flood warnings, no risk to life. Might be nice weather for these guys but for the people here in the northwest after a, a very, very miserable few weeks that they've had over the Christmas and New Year period. It's not very good for them. They'll be keeping an eye on the weather and hoping that Storm Jonas, as it uh, comes over the Atlantic after creating havoc over on the eastern seaboard of America, will not cause them too many problems other than a lot of water, hopefully staying on the ground and in the rivers and not getting into the properties.
It's feared a bushfire that has destroyed an entire town in Western Australia may be spreading to other areas. Almost 100 houses and municipal buildings have been burned to the ground in Yar Loop, south of Perth. At least four firefighters have been injured. Three people reported missing have been found safe and well. The fire continues to be uncontained and out of control. Uh, last night, as you're aware, there was um, a, a significant impact on Yalu. It appears that we've lost around 95 houses, a number of structures within the town site. The flames have been fanned by gusts of wind of up to 60 kilometres an hour. Oh, oh, I've heard this morning that just about everything's gone in Yalu. Like even our home and my neighbours and most of our communities, it's all gone. Forecasters have described the conditions as very tricky. Thunderstorms and strong winds could fan the flames and spread the fire further afield. The intense heat means it could generate its own weather system. Firefighters have a major battle on their hands tonight with towns in our southwest in the grip of a bushfire emergency. Waruna, Preston Beach and Harvey are all under threat. A firefighter has been hurt and a number of buildings destroyed in the fierce blazes, fanned by gusty winds and 40 degree temperatures. We know tonight at least one home. Buildings, cars, crops and livestock have been destroyed. So far the fire has burnt through 11,000 hectares of land. Tonight the blaze is described as erratic, dangerous and out of control. We have live reports coming up for you. But right now, 200 firefighters are still battling to bring these blazes under control. A long, hot and dangerous night. Waruna on fire. Two fierce blazes, one sparked by lightning, the other ember attacks. The flames fanned by unpredictable 60 kilometre an hour winds. The wind was horrific, you know, it was just... Oh, God knows how strong it was, but it was just the dust was just whipping up. The danger escalated quickly, forcing the entire town of Waruna to be evacuated late last night. Havoc. Yeah. Absolute havoc. There were blue lights and people leaving and just unbelievable, mate. If you don't get it out, who knows you know, what could have happened. Horrific. Yeah, been really bad all night. The ash was falling out of the sky. Just smoke was getting thicker and thicker. We made the decision then to pack what we could in the car. Early this morning, disaster. Temperatures hit 40 degrees, gusty winds pushing the blaze over the southwestern highway. It won't break up. This bridge at Samson Brook shows just how searing the heat was, buckling the asphalt, causing the bridge to collapse. Authorities say that stretch of the southwestern highway could be out of action for months. Residents have spent the day dealing with flare-ups around their properties and this wind after a long night battling that fire. It's obvious they couldn't save everything. Farmers are now counting the losses from decades of work. Cars, sheds, crops, dozens of livestock lost. This century-old Waruna home saved just in time. Its owners have spent years renovating it. Already pushed to their limits, firefighters faced another battle. <laughs> This afternoon, a wind change. Southwesterlies pushed the fire front towards the town of Harvey. Residents there forced to flee. Harvey Hospital and the Harvey Nursing Home also evacuated. The blaze was sparked near Nangabrook and moved quickly towards Waruna and now Harvey, also in danger, Yar Loop and Cookinup. We're not saying a Harvey. It's an evac forced evacuation. We're saying it's better off. You, you are under some danger. It's better off that you are not there. Police have now closed off the road to Preston Beach. No one is allowed in or out. This afternoon, a young firefighter was taken to hospital suffering burns to his back. We were fighting the fire and the sparks were going straight off the top of our head, landing 30, 40 metres out behind us. Tonight, it's a waiting game. Fire crews bracing for another uncertain night.
Alarms are being raised over food security in Southern Africa. According to the UN, an estimated 14 million people are facing hunger following prolonged dry spells that led to a poor harvest last year. Maria Galang with more. WFP is raising serious concerns that the El Nino global weather event, which is leading to even worse drought across Southern Africa, is already affecting this year's crop. The number of people without enough food could rise significantly over the coming months as the region moves deeper into the so-called lean season, the period before the April harvest when food and cash stocks become increasingly depleted. The World Food Programme also noted that the worst affected countries by last year's poor rains are Malawi, Madagascar and Zimbabwe. Lesotho has also declared a drought emergency and one-third of the population doesn't have enough food. Also of concern is the situation in Angola, Mozambique and Swaziland. Maria Galang, CCTV. Let's get more insights now on the situation south of the continent. CCTV's Angela Coppola is standing by live in Johannesburg. Angela, WFP is painting quite a grim picture of the food situation there in southern Africa. Just how bad is it? Is the impact being felt on the ground yet? Well, it's getting worse, Panina. In South Africa, we were told that stockpiles of maize, which is a staple diet here, will probably last until August or September. It's unclear if those local stockpiles, though, include any export tonnages to our neighbors that are suffering at the moment. In the meantime, the consumers here are starting to see small price increases, but those will eventually swell, some say to around 25% increases in monthly food bills. If those stockpiles run short and maize can't be exported quickly enough into our neighboring uh, countries, we'll probably start seeing some shortages there. Hopefully, though, it won't get to that at the moment. Panina? The food security threat, Angela, affects up to seven countries in that region. Do you get the sense that there is a coordinated regional response to this threat? Well, the situation is becoming uh, dire. There's no question there. In South Africa, we're going to have to import around 6 million tonnes. Zimbabwe, Lesotho, Namibia, Botswana and Swaziland are going to need around 5 million tonnes on top of that of soya and wheat. It's unclear when that import process is going to start and how it's going to be distributed into the countries because of the infrastructure challenges there. In terms of that coordinated effort, well, I'm not hearing anything at the moment. Not from SADC, and it's besides a report that was issued in December about the situation in those seven countries that form that uh, grouping. The most recent official communication we heard on the drought and the May shortage was on Friday from the South African Agriculture Minister, and he didn't mention a word of any coordinated effort other than those UN organizations that are starting to get involved in places like Zimbabwe. So hopefully there is work going on in the background, but we're not hearing anything officially just yet. Panina? All right, Angela, thanks very much for joining us. Angela Kupla live in Johannesburg. A dam in Senegal that used to provide water to the town, located in South Africa's free state, lies virtually arid after months of drought. Free State Province is one of four in the country that has been declared a disaster area by South Africa's Agricultural Department due to acute water shortages and unusually high temperatures. Farmer Bori Erasmus was born on the Bidolfsberg farm about 20 kilometers outside Senegal where dams and faucets have run dry. It is essential that the government steps in and helps farmers. As farmers, we have not received subsidies like in other countries such as in Western Europe and in the United States. So we are hardy farmers. We are used to getting by without much. But these are extraordinary circumstances and there is a need for the government to help. This is the first time in five decades that Erasmus's family farm has missed the spring planting season and he says the authorities need to do more. While Erasmus still has just enough borehole water and dried fodder to feed his cattle and wild game herds, other farmers have begun to rely on donations from farms in less affected areas. Around 8,000 households in Senegal have been facing severe water shortages since last month. The local municipality has started buying borehole water from surrounding farms at one cent per litre distributing about 50 litres of water per household at no cost. 
people wait for hours in long queues to receive water. We must understand that uh, we are in the middle of a crisis and we must act responsibly. It's not going to help screaming and shouting. We have to say, now that we are in this situation, and this is not a man-made situation, people must then be able to say, what are tangible alternatives and solutions? Makansi Kansi, who is a single mother of four children and works as a security guard, says she does not have time to queue for hours for clean water. I don't have time to go fetch water uh, because we have to queue from 2 a.m. until maybe around 5 and we are not even sure if we will get the water or what. So to make things uh, easy for me, I just come here to come and uh, get the water from this old sewage uh, dam to wash. Elsewhere, in preparation for schools reopening, dozens of women are using stagnant rainwater to wash clothes. The water, green with algae and swimming with tadpoles and litter, has been caught in an unfinished sewerage treatment tank that is now being used as a well. Mahia Mutua, CCTV. An emergency is unfolding in Fiji as tropical cyclone Winston batters the Pacific Island nation. The powerful Category 5 storm is the strongest ever to hit the South Pacific nation, putting thousands of lives at risk and trapping Australian holidaymakers. Cyclone Winston bears down on Fiji, packing winds of 300 kilometres an hour. Visible from space, the massive cyclone draws its strength from the Pacific. At Winston's heart, winds are closer to 325 kilometres per hour. The worst is yet to come, but uh, within the, you know, within the uh, last hour, it's definitely intensified. The impending ferocity of the cyclone saw locals board up shops in hotels. And people are rushing to get ready. By early afternoon, Cyclone Winston hit the outer island of Vanua Levu, sinking boats and causing flash flooding. Heavy rain pour and destructive uh, storm winds. 80 evacuation centres have opened up across the nation as residents seek shelter from Fiji's first ever recorded Category 5 cyclone. One of the most powerful cyclones in living history has hit the Pacific nation of Fiji, flattening entire villages. Winds of up to 185 miles an hour swept across the islands over the weekend, killing at least 21 people and causing widespread damage. John Donison reports. Two days after Fiji's worst cyclone in living memory, only now is the extent of the damage becoming apparent. Winston has left a trail of destruction. Many remote communities in this nation of more than 300 islands remain cut off. The cyclone made landfall on Fiji's main island of Viti Levu around 7 o'clock, just as darkness was falling on Saturday evening, and then tracked westwards. Homes have been destroyed. Many low-lying areas have flooded and uh, many people have been left stunned. Power lines have gone down all over the country and roofing, iron, glass, live electric wires and other hazardous uh, materials pose serious threats to public safety. Fijians are doing what they can to rebuild, but it's going to take time and money. For now, they're just lucky to be alive. There were eight of us, including one old lady. So we have to carry the old lady to the church. We were inside the house, so it was very strong. Damaged everything, so we have to run for our life. 
would like to ask the government for help, for assistance as soon as possible. Thankfully, Fiji's capital, Suva, was spared a direct hit. But aid agencies fear once rescue teams reach more remote areas, it's likely the death toll will continue to rise. John Donison, BBC News. Devastation across the Fiji Islands in the wake of supercyclone Winston. Entire villages flattened, roads underwater, boats smashed on the coast. On the ground, residents are only beginning to take stock of the massive damage left by the storm. Only the walls of the school building remain. The roof had been blown by strong winds. The houses in the school compound were destroyed. Traumatic uh, experience for the residents of uh, Queen Victoria's well. This man has lost everything. He evacuated his home just in time. We said it doesn't matter if uh, you lost the house or the car or whatever. The only thing is to not to lose your life. Super Cyclone Winston was one of the strongest to ever hit the southern hemisphere. It left a trail of destruction. Winds were blowing with gusts of up to 325 kilometers per hour, ripping off trees from the ground. Torrential rains downed power lines and many areas are still without electricity. Floodwaters penetrated buildings, including hospitals, where patients had to be moved to safer areas. Remote islands have yet to be reached. In cities catering to tourists like Nadi, residents are beginning to clean up. But repairs could take several weeks. And aid efforts are being slowed down by damaged roads and debris. We're sort of in the middle of this uh, heat wave, four day heat wave lasting right through until Thursday with temperatures well above 30 degrees in the city, getting higher than that still uh, in the western suburbs before peaking on Thursday with temperatures above 40 degrees. And since, uh, since records have been kept, this would make it only the second time we've had a second four day heat wave in summer. Of course, hot days, no stranger to summer, but to get a heat wave of this length, pretty unusual. Good evening. Perth is heading for a record heat wave with temperatures tipped to hover above 39 degrees for five days straight. The sweltering conditions begin this weekend, prompting a serious health alert. 34 degrees today and it's going to get much hotter. On Sunday up to 40, then 41 for Monday. The Bureau is predicting the temperature will top 39 for five consecutive days, a Perth weather record. Going hand in hand with this is some very high nighttime temperatures as well. Those temperatures could be as high as 24, 25 overnight. But not all suburbs are equal. New research from UWA shows suburbs without greenery are much hotter than those with tree lined streets and parks. In some places, a 40 degree day can feel like 50. 10 degrees is a lot. Only one degree can kill people, one degree difference. 10 degrees is huge. The research says Perth's hottest suburbs include Hamilton Hill, Coobalup, Bentley, Como, Stirling, Kingsley and Woodvale. And on our hottest days, our outer suburbs are some of the worst for heat-related medical emergencies, including Wanneroo, the Swan Valley, Armidale and Rockingham. The health department's already issued a heat stroke warning. When people stop sweating, become very red and their temperature, their core temperature rapidly rises and that can start damaging internal uh, organs. It's been a strange summer for weather so far. We've had a relatively small number of days over 35, just 15 since the start of December. In January we had a record five days of thunderstorms and on the first of the month we had the coldest February night in 81 years, just 9.9 .9 degrees. From Sunday, Surf Life Saving will put on extra patrols. Transperth will slow their trains by 20 kilometres per hour so tracks don't buckle and schools without air conditioning may Close. So they need to take care, they need to be taking on board lots of water, making sure they're seeking shade and doing the sun smart things. Jerry DeMassey, Nine News.
In parts of Thailand, water has become a very precious commodity. The government ordered the drilling of around 6,000 new wells to try to help people through the dry season. At the moment, the water is for domestic use only. It's being rationed and sent to homes in rural areas where people are growing increasingly frustrated by the drought. It affects everyone around here. Why? We rely on rain for living our lives and farming. I don't understand why we don't have enough water. Without a lot of irrigation, it's too dry here to grow rice more than once a year. So many farmers usually plant alternative crops in the dry season. But now they've been told not to use any water on their fields. Rare clouds and light rain offer some hope, but no change for An Jian Pu Chow, who normally grows soybeans at this time of year. I don't have enough water to do anything now. We can't even use water in canals provided by the irrigation department. And ponds around here are too far from my area. There are creative sources of food and income left in the fields. But Thailand's economy is struggling. And on the back of a slump in rice exports last year, it's a worrying time. This is not just an environmental issue. It's also a symptom of Thailand's volatile political situation. Because governments come and go so quickly, real national issues like developing a sustainable water management plan are neglected. The irrigation department says the problem is a lack of water storage. Our water management plan is based on scientific and academic research and results, but we don't have enough dams or reservoirs to keep all the rainfall. Others disagree and believe governments don't work closely enough with farmers to find solutions. Some also blame a lack of seasonal planning. They don't use the experts to forecast for the next three year, four year what will happen. Right? So there is a, a risk management. Right? If you don't do risk management, you will have the problem like this. The risk now is that the dry season may extend beyond May and begin to affect planting of the next rice crop, which is due to begin in June. Wayne Hay, Al Jazeera, Concan. Cars adrift in the torrent. Now the authorities in Peru is sending the military to help areas affected by floods that have afflicted several parts of the country. Scientists blame El Nino, the warm ocean current, for the heavy rains that turned roads into rivers in Arequipa. The southern province has been particularly badly hit. At least two people were reportedly killed. The Andean nation has struggled for over a week to cope with violent weather that's also caused landslides and power cuts. Residents in Tumbes, a coastal region in the northwest, were also left to survey the damage. Local media reported that 3,000 people in the area had been left homeless, with 30,000 affected in some way. The World Meteorological Organization has already said this year's El Nino is the strongest in over 15 years and could grow stronger still. <laughs> How widespread the damage is? I mean, obviously, mobile homes and RVs, um, you know, are notorious in a situation like this. Uh, but as we look at it, at least its extended uh, view through an extended lens, it, it, I mean, it looks like uh, 
uh, uh, it, it looks like the place has been leveled. How, how widespread is it in reality? Yeah, it, actually, it, it seems like it's almost a straight line straight through here. If you look at the picture, you can see that it just almost goes straight back through this RV park here. But on the left and right sides, save for the uh, power lines that were ripped down here, which could happen for, you know, a ways afterward. Um, but if it, it, let, me, let me get Lance to take a look over. You can see some residents here, one man maybe with a bandage on his head over here. Storm Imogen has hit the south coast of England, resulting in a number of flood and travel warnings and gale force winds. Gusts of nearly 100 miles per hour caused rush hour travel problems and the closure of some transport links. Almost 15,000 homes in the southwest, Midlands and Wales have been left without power. The Met Office has issued amber be prepared warnings for the southwest and yellow be aware alerts stretching from southern Wales to the Thames estuary. There are 59 flood warnings and 178 flood alerts in place with travel disruption expected to continue. Rather a dramatic journey to work for some commuters this morning. This Arriva train was drenched by waves near Barmouth. And further down the coast in Aberystwyth, large waves battering the coastline there overnight. National Rail says coastal routes are most likely to be affected and is advising people to check before they travel. Arriva Trains Wales tweeted these pictures saying trains are unable to run on parts of the Cambrian line due to flood water being above a safe level. Sky's Joe Tidy is in Exeter. Well, it's not just coastal areas that have been affected by this storm. We're in Exeter at the moment, and take a look at this scene here. This morning, about 8 o'clock, this tree, well, a good chunk of this tree came right down onto uh, this gentleman's house here and the car, and he tells me, he's actually quite shaken up about it, he tells me he was minutes away from dropping off his daughter in school, so he would have got in that driver's seat, and then this would have happened. 8 a.m., he said, it sounded like an explosion when the tree came down and crashed into the car. Look at the roof here, completely caved in. His daughter would have been sat in the passenger side, obviously. It, you dread to think what could have happened. And lots of damage here on the back of the car as well. Take a look at the house. As I said, the gentleman doesn't want to talk to us. He said he's too busy with insurance and issues like that to talk to, uh, talk to me, which is absolutely understandable. But you can see the, the tiles smashed off of the... Uh, the porch here and the garage as well. He says there's likely to be um, holes right the, right the way through the garage, uh, possibly causing some leaking, but he says he doesn't want to look at it, at it yet. He's, um, he's quite upset about the whole situation. But uh, let's speak to the tree surgeons here, the emergency tree surgeons who've been brought in to get rid of this as quickly as possible. They've said they've actually got to get this tree down in the next 24 hours, just in case any more of it goes by. Nick Wright, I've just oh. got you at exactly the wrong moment, <laughs> just as you pick up a heavy log. Tell us, what, what sort of winds do you think would have been able to bring a tree like this down? Um, well, it forecasts, forecasts well up to sort of 60, 70 mile an hour. Um, unfortunately, the tree had a weak union, so, but impossible to tell that from where it position it was in. So do you think it would have, would have gone even if the wind wasn't as powerful as um, it has been today? Eventually, it's hard to say, really, but um, yeah, there's a weak union there. Unfortunately, with these gales, the sail effect, it's just luckily nobody was in that car. Yeah, and... and it must have been quite a chunk of it as well to actually land on the house oh, as yes. well as the car. Yeah, yeah, it was a good few tonne there, I've got to say. Are you going to have a busy day today driving I around? I reckon so, mate. Late night. Yeah. It's all money, isn't it? So. All right. <laughs> <laughs> nice to speak to you. Thank you very much. Well, like I say, it's not just the coastal regions where we were earlier, which had gusts of 70, 80, even 96 miles an hour on the, on the Isle of Wight. It is these inland areas which are also feeling the brunt of this storm. Well, there has been precious little water in southern and eastern Africa where El Nino is scorching the earth. The UN says as many as a million children are at risk of starvation. Many are in the tiny nation of Lesotho, and we sent Deborah Pata there. 
Dawn breaks over Hakabele. Villagers hope for rain, but it promises to be another scorching day. 70-year-old Malaporta Makara wakes her five grandchildren, most of them orphaned by AIDS. It doesn't take long to get the three eldest ready for school. That's because there is nothing to eat. Like everyone else in the village, Makara's crops have failed. It is painful, says nine-year-old Ditti Pizzo, to go to school without food. This drought, his grandmother explains, is more severe than I have ever seen. Makara knows instinctively what experts have confirmed. This is the strongest El Nino on record in southern Africa, delaying the rains and putting 14 million people at risk of starvation. A pitiful burst of rain in recent days has coaxed out some greenery. It's a cruel illusion as it's come too late. This should be Lesotho's rainy season. Normally I wouldn't be able to stand here because I'd be waist high in water. Instead, this riverbed is bone dry. UN humanitarian coordinator Yolanda Das Gupta is worried at what's ahead. The rainfall has been delayed to an extent that people haven't been able to plant the crops that they need to survive. So we're looking at people having not enough to eat at least until 2017. At school, Makara's grandchildren get their one meal of the day, a bowl of watery porridge and some corn. But as the country's grain supplies run out, schools are worried they will have to stop their feeding schemes. Water is a concern too. Lesotho's government trucks deliver water to the villagers, but it is not enough. A nearby dam has only two weeks supply left before it too runs dry. At home, Makara manages to scrounge for a few unripened peaches for the younger children. And later, when their brothers and sisters return, she rests for the first time. There is no supper once again. If I can just give them food and love, she sighs, then they will be fine. The suit who desperately needs at least $27 million to feed people on the brink of starvation, but they are battling to attract the attention of international donors, Scott, who are already overstretched dealing with other global crises. Remarkable reporting from Deborah Pata tonight, who's back in Johannesburg. Deborah, thank you. The drought has hit much of the southern African region, including the maize belt in South Africa. In Lesotho, Swaziland, Zambia and Zimbabwe, planting delayed by two months or more has severely impacted maize yields. Malawi is experiencing its first maize deficit in a decade, pushing the price 73% higher than the December 2015 average. In Mozambique, prices were 50% higher than last year. The World Food Programme says food production in Zimbabwe has fallen by half compared to last year and maize is 53% more expensive. Zimbabwe's government last year said it would need $1.6 billion in aid after the drought. El Nino events usually bring drier conditions to southern Africa and wetter ones to East Africa. The dry, hot conditions are expected to persist until the start of the southern hemisphere autumn in April or May. Catherine Ogunde, CCTV. Now to the second installment of our special report on the drought in the Horn of Africa. It hasn't rained there for years and malnourishment rates are soaring. Africa correspondent Martin Kadahi has more from Somaliland. Water is so scarce in parts of Somalia, people and animals will walk for a whole day to get a drink. Many come to places like this where the water table isn't too deep. If it continues to be this dry, the animals will die, and then we will die too. In some parts, water storages are being improved by hand, but the rains are still months away at best. We used to eat three times a day. Now that there's no rain, there is nothing to eat. Across East and Southern Africa, malnutrition rates are soaring. This Somali girl was days away from death when she was admitted to hospital. In remote regions under the baking sun, charities do what they can to help starving villagers. 
This is one of the worst affected areas and mobile clinics like this one assess children. Now some of them here today have already shown signs of severe malnutrition and what that means is without interventions like this they would surely die of starvation. Dexan Waberi is a four-year-old girl who's just 11 kilograms. That's the average weight of a two-year-old toddler. The team found her today and uh, when they miss her, they found her that she's severely malnourished. We have to walk very far to get any kind of help and what help there is is so little. Save the Children says it can only do so much. You know what we are doing is very minimum and we can't reach many people because the scale is so big. In Ethiopia and Somalia, close to 20 million people will need food aid this year. It's now a disaster in slow motion. Martin Karahi, ABC News, Somaliland, Northern Somalia.